Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so um, I wrote a few things already. Uh, just um, I want to finish this section four that we began last time. Um, and so last time we introduced our tilde domains and our tilde Hardy fields. Basically, our tilde Hardy fields are Hardy fields that are closed under the primitive operations of the um, O minimal expansion R tilde of the real field R. And we generalized to this setting earlier results on Hausdorff fields and Hardy fields. <clears throat> so um, I got some comments back. Um, namely about this so-called cheap trick. And I did in fact swept, sweep under the rug some uh, a, a key fact uh, that's relevant here, namely that this theory of R tilde has definable scolum functions. And that is needed to show that this extended theory T hat that I introduced has a universal axiomatization. <clears throat> and of course that was really used in, in the rest of the argument. Um, anyway, I will come back to that in the question session on Thursday um, to write. Also, um, I forgot that I already had an, a term for what we call total, um, although it's really the, the negation of total, so to say, namely oscillating. Um, and that's a term that we use in our notes on, on Hardy fields. I mean, when I, we say our, uh, we, I mean, uh, Matthias, Joris, and I in the things that we are writing. So we use the terminology, and that's also used by Bojanitsan that a germ oscillates if it's not the zero germ, so it's not eventually zero, uh, but it is zero for arbitrarily large t. Um, right, so you can think of like the sine function, which uh, has infinitely many zeros, but which is not eventually zero. <clears throat> um, and in the terminology that I introduced last time, this is simply saying that the pair g comma zero is not total. But this oscillating terminology, I think, is more intuitive, and so that's what I'm going to use from now on. <clears throat> um, and I want to finish this section with uh, two facts. One with, um, which is kind of, anal both of them are analogous to things that we already did for ordinary Hardy fields, but now we have them for R tilde Hardy fields. So let H be an R tilde Hardy field and assume also that is a model of T. So that is analogous to H being real closed. <clears throat> And that G be a, a continuous germ. And then each in each of the following situations, um, and I, co I consider four, four things. We have the case that G minus H does not oscillate, uh, no matter which H in little H in H, right? So, uh, or you could say the pair G comma H is total for every H and H, but I promised that I'm going to use from now on the oscillating terminology. <clears throat> um, so in each of the following four situations, it is the case that G minus H does not oscillate for every H and H. And the, um, then of course you can form the, uh, <clears throat> the T closure of the Hardy the R tilde Hardy domain generated by H, and that will again be an R tilde Hardy field, right? And in fact, you can also describe it. This is basically uh, reminding you what H, what this T closure is. Um, it's also the, uh, uh, the R hat domain generated by G over H. It's, <clears throat> it's um, Sorry, R tilde hat domain, I should say. Anyway, the, 
the four cases that we are considering here are um, one possibility is D, D is a real number. And that means that then you, that means that you always can join any real number to a, an R tilde Hardy domain, Hardy fields. And uh, you get again an R tilde Hardy field if, once you take the T closure. Uh, second case is uh, that G is uh, a con uh, continuously differentiable germ with derivative in H. So we can take anti you can join n anti derivatives or uh, you can join exponentials. That's three, and you can join logarithms. Oh, there I have to say G is log f. Whenever f is a positive uh, element in H, and now the fact that for such G's, G minus H does not oscillate for every H and H. <clears throat> that was already proved for R, for ordinary real closed Hardy fields. So certainly for R tilde Hardy fields that are models of T. And then the rest is simply an exercise along the, the lines of the proof of the lemma that we finished proving last time. <clears throat> and it's also very similar to the, how we did it for ordinary real closed Hardy fields. So. I can certainly leave that to you as a uh, right. So uh, the other thing that I want to add to this section, I'm finished with it, is this for, we can now generalize this result about first order ordinary differential equations over Hardy fields to do it also over R tilde Hardy fields. And so I'm going to carefully state this. Um, let's, H B R tilde Hardy field. Uh, a new, um, well, let's say open. Uh, and definable. Uh, and phi instead of semi algebraic, of course, I'm now using definable um, uh, phi c one u also definable and suppose we have h one up to h n in h. Uh, an eta, a C1 germ, continuously differentiable germ, and are such that um, eventually you have this differential equation satisfied for eta, eventually. Um, uh, well, first of all, HT eta t should be in the domain of uh, capital phi. So that, and then eta prime t equals phi h t. Yeah. So here you have the differential equation satisfied by eta. Um, and as before, h t is just an abbreviation for h1 t dot 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 h n t. Okay, then eta as before, then eta lies in R tilde Hardy fields extended. And um, well, the proof is much like the one that we already gave uh, for ordinary Hardy fields. Um, yeah, so much like 
like uh, that of the semi-algebraic case. Uh, capital V is semi-algebraic and U is semi-algebraic. Case um, three, which was number three one one first extent for this result. Of course, you can always make H bigger, <coughs> um, and so uh, arrange that it contains all the real numbers and is also a model of T. Right by going to the T closure, first extent H, so that so that. Um, for the extended H, you get R, all the real numbers are in it, and it's a model of T. Then show, as in that proof, uh, eta minus H does not oscillate. Uh, for every for every H and H, little H and big H. Right. Yeah, and then, then we have uh, the, this already tells us that we have an R tilde domain. Um, H. Generated by eta, well, and, and it's T closure, of course, uh, is, which is also the L hat uh, domain, the R tilde hat domain generated by eta over H. And it's all, yeah, right, um, it's all in C1. Uh, I think I already mentioned some, some fact that. Um, since eta is C1 and all the elements in capital H are C1, uh, this, all the things in this T closure will also be C1. So that is not. Um, um, and now show that this is actually an R tilde Hardy field. Now show, of course, it's a field because it's a model of T. <clears throat> now show um, H eta. Matilda Hardy field. Um, yeah, and here the argument is a little different from the semi algebraic case, because in the semi algebraic case, we could use minimum polynomials and so on. And, um, and here you have to argue a little um, differently. But again, I think it's better to do this as an exercise than for me to spell out the details, which are fairly routine, um, yeah, by arguments. Uh, dif uh, different from the same as break, uh, different. Well, a bit, of course you can use same minimum polynomials, but, um, different from the same other break. I mean, the proof of the lemma that we finished with last time already contains certain arguments that are in the same style from the same other break. Right. Right. Okay, so this, this gives a considerable extension, I would think, of, of the what we did for first order ODEs over ordinary Hardy fields. Um, although it would be nice to, to actually give some concrete applications of this, maybe at some point that will be done, but for the moment, let's start a new section, <clears throat> right? So now <clears throat> I still want to start stick with ODEs uh, and you might wonder, 
uh, why we pay so much attention to such a special case that I'm going to discuss now. The ODE Y double. So now you see it's a second order differential equation over the Hardy field. Yeah, by the way, here I'm again just returning to the ordinary setting of Hardy fields, but um, but various things that I'm doing probably make sense in the setting of R tilde Hardy fields as well. And it would be nice if, if for someone to work that out. Uh, I didn't, but um, it could definitely have so its use. The ODE over Hardy fields. So I, I, I want to give a kind of defense of my focus on this. Um, well, first of all, we meet an interesting phenomenon uh, in for this, which is which you don't see for first order differential equations. Um, you meet here. We meet. Let me just write it out. In by the way, if if you look at h is zero, a, y double plus y is zero, then you know that you have solutions sine x and cosine x, but of course they do not belong to Hardy fields. But of course, at, there is one linear combination of sine x and cosine x, namely zero, <laughs> which, is, which is in a Hardy field. <laughs> but that's the only linear combination of sine x and cosine x. Here we meet an interesting phenomenon. Um, let H, yeah, so let H be a Hardy field. Um, then for some, then for some H and H, some uh, H and H, um, there is exactly one solution. In a, in a Hardy field extension, there is exactly one. Yeah, maybe I should say this ODE, Y double plus Y is H, always has infinitely many solutions in, um, well, not in C less than infinity, but in C less than infinity with I adjoint. Um, <clears throat> no, even in C less than infinity, it has. Uh, infinitely many solutions. Sorry, I that is exactly. But the question is, when do they lie in a Hardy field? That is exactly one um, H in C two. Um, one solution. One solution. Right. Um, of. Y double plus Y equals H uh, generating, uh, well, or you could say that lies in a Hardy field extension or generating a Hardy field over H. It lies in a Hardy field extension of H. And for other H in H, um, there are infinitely many that do this. And yeah, so this, this first situation happens, for example, if H is zero, because I, as I already mentioned, then the only solution that you have is the zero solution, the trivial solution. And for other H in H, yeah. Um, for all other, yeah. So for all other H and H that are infinitely many, many um, solution, such solutions. But you will see, but note 
if you have infinitely many solutions that lie in, um, and each of them lies in some Hardy field extensions. <clears throat> Lau, yeah. Yes, sorry, I think there is a conflict of notation. You call H the solution and the parameter in the equation, if I'm not confused. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. There is a uh, thing. Um, why? Y in C2. And for all the A's, there are infinitely many. Right. Okay. Now I think it's, it's correct. Um, but note that um, if you have infinitely many such solutions, in a given Hardy field extension, there can only be one in, in, a, in it. Because if you have two in it, then the difference would be a solution of y double plus y is zero, and which means that it would be a linear combination of sine x and cosine x, and that can never happen unless it's the zero solution. So in a given Hardy field extension, there can only be one solution, <clears throat> although the, in total there are infinitely many solutions that lie in the Hardy field. <clears throat> so yeah, that is a really new phenomenon that you do not meet for first order. Uh, differential equation. And that is one of the main reasons to pay attention to this. Um, <clears throat> right. And I want to also make the other uh, um, ground for paying so much attention. Well, first of all, second order differential equations are really the, the ones that are uh, important in physics. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, they occur a lot there. And um, <clears throat> Uh, but, you know, for us, the reason is really the reason to pay, to focus, the reason to focus, to focus on, on first and second order, even very special uh, ODEs, namely linear ones, ODEs. Um, is that the reason for us? I mean, there's a huge literature about second order linear differential equations. Um, and, and there are all kinds of, and the reasons for that, for the literature to focus on it is, is, is sometimes related to why we focus on it, but not always. Um, and second order linear ODEs uh, is that they, is that they control to a large extent uh, the entire story about solving algebraic story about solving about solving uh, arbitrary, well, algebraic or the ease given by a differential, setting a differential polynomial equal to zero, uh, or the ease over Hardy fields. Uh, and you can view this as a kind of analogy to the fact that for, if you take an arbitrary one variable polynomial over R, a non-zero one variable polynomial over R, then it splits into linear and quadratic factors, right? So there you already see also a kind of reduction to linear polynomials and quadratic polynomials. And it's, it's a bit of, a, there is an analogy there which, uh, And it's good to keep that in mind. Um, of course, the reduction to that case is itself uh, a, a non-trivial story, but, um, but that's a reason to, to focus so much on really understanding first and second order linear ODEs in detail over Hardy fields. Um, okay, let me also mention original source for 
uh, this section. At least for what I'm doing today. Yeah, yeah, a random source for, for what I'm doing today uh, for section five. Uh, it really comes from a very um, nice paper by Bojanitsan. called second order uh, differential equations. Equations over Hardy fields. Um, <clears throat> Journal of London Math Society. There's also one very puzzling claim in that paper, unproved claim, which he proved, promised to come back to, but never did, but which we can actually now, now prove, but probably with totally different methods than he had in mind or that he suggested. Um, Anyway, that I will come back to that later. 1987, 109 to 120. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. So one fact that will play a role is uh, if you have a C1 germ that oscillates, C1 oscillates, then so does the derivative. Does d prime, which of course is a just a continuous germ in general. You, I mean, visu visually, this is fairly clear. If you have something like uh, uh, a function that goes up, goes up over the, goes, um, let's say, above the x-axis and uh, below the x-axis infinitely many times when you go to infinity, then of course in between two zeros, you will have um, a zero of the derivative by, by uh, roller. <coughs> um, okay, that will be used. Um, so let me start here, the subsection 5.1. And this is actually about ODEs of, uh, that are a bit more general in nature, y double equals phi y. Phi semi algebraic over h. Well, I. Uh, I'm not explaining here exactly what, what we mean by semi algebraic over H, but you can think of in the case that H is real closed, well, then there isn't a natural notion of semi algebraic there. <clears throat> um, but uh, what I really will prove is something uh, stated in a more precise way, and but it basically means that we are looking at such ordinary differential equation. And you see that there is something special about it, namely that Y prime doesn't show up. Y double is, is uh, capital Phi Y, but there is no Y prime there on the right-hand side. <clears throat> okay, 5.11 is, a, is a, an elementary lemma, which is basically saying, um, something about oscillation. Uh, suppose, let's say, um, H in C1 oscillates. Then two, one of two things, or actually both can happen, then one or two below. Yeah, 
So in fact, usually both one and two will happen, but um, <clears throat> there are arbitrary large S's where F where H prime is zero. There are and H S is greater than zero. There are arbitrary there are arbitrarily large reals S with uh, <clears throat> F prime is where F prime vanishes, but where F is positive. And two is just the same, except with F as negative, there are arbitrarily large S with F prime S is zero, and now F is negative. Now, if you think of something like the sine function, where you really go up, um, go, um, uh, how do you say that, higher than the x-axis and lower than the x-axis infinitely many times, then both will happen, but... Um, no. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, F, in, in your notes, F is H? Or... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, um, yeah, absolutely. Oh. I, I sometimes change my notation because I think that it would be... But then I, I forget to... Uh, uh, forget to... Change it. H. Ah. Um, H prime S zero and then H S. And then, uh, oh, I forgot here. Right. Oh yeah, but okay. So usually this both will happen, but but um, it can happen that only one is the case. But not, uh, in any case, in case one, there are also arbitrary large s, and that is the consequence that we really need. But also arbitrarily large. S with H prime S is zero and H S less than or equal to zero. So that requires a little bit of thought. And the best thing is to simply draw pictures and and convince yourself of it. Um, you know, it's the same. Look at local maxima and minima between successive zeros and so on, um, and you will convince yourself that this is the case. In case two, there are uh, there are uh, also arbitrary large large s. that H prime vanishes and H S greater than equal to zero. Right. So proof, as I said, is basically exercise. And if you, you can see how to do this by drawing pictures and paying attention to local minima and maxima and things like that. <clears throat> Okay, so now uh, uh, a more serious lemma. That it's the Hardy field. And let two germs be given, FG. Uh, in C1, C1 germs such that 
uh, F generates a Hausdorff field over capital H such that F generates or lies in a Hausdorff field extension, if you like, generates a field uh, HF over H. Um, and G is in the real closure of this. Yeah. And G is in, you know, we can always form the real closure of a Hausdorff field again, which is again a Hausdorff field. And then I want to say something about how the derivative behaves on, uh, yeah, then for K. Uh, H, F, G. Right, of course, F and G also generate a subfield of, of this real closure. Um, and now everything is in C1, right? H is a Hardy field, F and G are in C1. So this is H, F, R, C, which is a harder field. It's a subset of, it consists purely of C1 germs. So you can take derivatives, then for case H, FG, uh, we have the following. If you take a, if you apply the, the derivation uh, of that is defined on C1 maps it into C, this maps, del, this maps capital K into K plus K uh, F prime. Right, well, <clears throat> And here I, well, in a way, I did already arguments of this type in some sense, but um, let me let me give more details anyway, enough to show uh, that G prime. So K is generated over, let me see. Uh, Oh, yeah. enough to show G prime in K plus KF prime. Since we can use this then, then if we can show that, we can of course apply this to any element of, uh, of K. <clears throat> then we can, then we can use that. So we can then use this any element of K, K um, instead of G. Right. Okay, now the usual uh, derivation rules, some product quotient rules, uh, usual rules for taking derivatives, you certainly get that the delta of HF is contained in HF plus HF, F prime, yeah? You take a rational function in, in F and you take the derivative, you use the quotient rule and so on, um, <clears throat> you, will, you will get this. Um, so let's PY. In ky, uh, well, let py in ky be the minimum polynomial polynomial. <clears throat> um, ah, no, I'm making a mistake here. Um, Let py hf y be the minimum polynomial of g over hf g over hf. 
Right. Uh, then, of course, the, the, that means in particular that PG is zero. And that gives, in the usual fashion, G prime is, we have seen that several times already, uh, P prime G. Right, so P delta, P superscript delta is simply the polynomial P where you replace each coefficient, which is an element of HF by its, uh, <clears throat> By its derivative. And P prime G is simply the formal derivative with respect to the variable Y, yeah? um, which previously I indicated by a partial derivative with respect to Y, but um, I'm now just considering it as an ordinary polynomial over, over HF. <clears throat> okay, and so if we now check this, now P delta G is an element of, if you do the usual computations, well, delta HF uh, times, yeah, that, that, that is clear because um, um, the coefficients of P are in HF and then the derivatives are in delta HF, right? So, and this is, as we already, and since delta HF, um, we already have this inclusion upstairs for the delta HF. So this is then contained in K plus K F prime. And then uh, also for, for the denominator P prime G, you just have, uh, that is just an element of K a non-zero element of K, right? Because the coefficients remain in, uh, in HF um, and then you plug in G and um, well, and what was G and K and K was simply the, the field generated by G over HF. So, so therefore uh, G prime is in, indeed in K plus KF. Oh. Okay, so that's just an elementary lemma about derivatives, but now we can state the theorem, which I think is a very ingenious result, I think, in my opinion, by Bojanitsyn. Let H be a Hardy field, uh, real close now. Hardy field. Um, and suppose we have a germ, a C2 germ. generates a Hausdorff field a Hausdorff field over H H G uh, but in such a way that the second derivative of G Let me write G double is in H G is in the real closure of H G. Yeah, um, right. Okay, then G then G generates a Hardy field, and we can even specify what it is. Yeah, you can think of this as a differential equation as G satisfying a second order differential equation over H, namely G double equals a certain semi-algebraic function of G. So that is why I call this, uh, I call this section Y double is phi Y with phi semi-algebraic over H because 
you can view this. And that's also how Bojanitsan formulated in a rather complicated way, but precise formulation is simply that G double is in the real closure of HG. <clears throat> then G generates, then G generates a Hardy field A body field. And I can ex explicitly say that it is this one over H. Right. And now let me take a look at my the time. Oh, I'm already five. I'm all only have five minutes left, <laughs> and and the proof of this is actually uh, um, well one and a half page long, and it's it's elementary, but it's clever, and so there are things um, there are interesting maneuverings going on in the proof that uh, yeah I think I need I need next time to do this um, and I probably um, should simply stop now because it's only, I only have a few minutes left. But of course, if there are any comments or questions, please let me know. Um, sure, we can take a question or two uh, since we have about three minutes. Lau, yes, I have a question. Uh, it's about uh, the the very first sentence, the first sentence that you made under section five. Sorry, uh, uh, say again. Where? Uh, section five, the beginning of the section. You. Uh, okay. You said that I'm not sure to understand the, the sentence when you said that for some H there is exactly one solution, but for other A, all other H's, there are infinitely many solutions. Uh, yes, but they, but these solutions, each of them, when I say there is exactly one solution Y in C2 that lies in a Hardy field. And so the other thing is, that for all other H's, there are infinitely many C2 solutions that lie in some Hardy fields, but different. But if you take a different, if you, the infinitely many lie, so, solutions lie in different Hardy fields. They are not lying all in the same Hardy field because that's impossible. Okay, that was my, my question. Yeah. Um, I hope, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Of course, when I state the theorem formally, then I think it will be more precise. But the main point to understand is that either there is a unique C2 solution, and that one does lie in a Hardy field extension of H, or there are infinitely many C2, C2 solutions, each of them also lying in a Hardy field, uh, but never in the same. Yeah, two okay. different solutions will have to lie in different Hardy fields. All Extent of, of eights. Yeah, they are pairwise incompatible. Yeah, they are incompatible, and that is a new phenomenon that we haven't met in the earlier extension results, um, and that's why it's worth it. Thank you. Into that, yeah. It, yeah. It's like the the behavior for. Uh, Vector fields. The, this. Ah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that there are similar phenomena there too. Yeah. Right. In dimension three. Okay. Right. Yeah, I see that I do not express it very correctly. Uh, there is exactly one solution why, and that one, and that solution will then actually be in a highly field extension of H. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 I sh whoever is going to write this down, uh, uh, 
in a final version we would have to correct the statement a little bit yeah <clears throat> or make it clearer thank you all right then i will stop the recording okay